Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Selig, the Artistic Director of the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. So excited to be here behind the curtain with you today. Oh, my goodness. So as you know, we opened the National LGBTQ Center for the Arts in January, and then in March, we shut her down thanks to COVID. One of the things that we had wanted to do were behind the curtain interviews with people that were important in our lives and heroes of, of, of our movement. Today, we get to do one of those. I am so excited to introduce to you, which of course needs no introduction, and that is activist, actor, and self-proclaimed most photographed nun in the world, none other than Sister Roma. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Tim. Hello. It's so great to see you. This is beyond exciting. I mean, this beyond behind the curtain, and many of you will, this will be the first one you've watched because it's going to be outrageous and fabulous. Go back and look at the others. They're nice. They're nice people. They're no, good. You humble. There are some great interviews. I'm so honored to be part of this series. Oh, I've been catching oh, up with you. I mean, well, about Kristen Chenoweth? Yeah, she's, oh. she's she's one of them. Yeah, yes, she is. Such a good interview. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're going to have to go back to the beginning, of course, uh, because people, not everybody knows your history and how you ended up looking this fabulous, um, coming from what, Michigan? Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's right. That, that, that didn't happen in Grand Rapids. No. Um, but have you been back to Grand Rapids as Sister Roma? You know, I haven't. I have to be honest. I've lived in San Francisco for like 36 years, and I've only been back to Michigan a handful of times. Well, Michigan's loss. Well, it was a really nice place to grow up and it's come a long way. But when I lived there, it was super conservative. I I was always pretty out. I think when I finally said the words I'm gay to some friends in college, they were like, oh, you know, really? (laughs) It was kind of obvious. I've always been pretty much myself who I am. I was class president all four years in high school. I I still have wonderful friends from there. I had a lovely family. I'm very, very fortunate. Uh, But there was just so much more of the world that I wanted to see. So I haven't made many trips back to Grand Rapids and never like this. Right. Well, that was a a sidetrack. But I did want to, like, give the audience a little taste of of where you're from, a a Midwest girl. Yeah. yeah, The Marian kind, they say about Midwest girls, like good, hearty stock. So, um, So, Sister Roma, you moved to San Francisco. And uh, I want, we want to know about that, sort of like why you moved. And then I know about uh, when you first saw, when you, when you saw your first sister in, um, in drag, in costume, whatever you call that. What do you call this? Well, it traditionally is called habit. So the sisters wear right. habit. But we okay. are, I, I've always considered myself a drag queen. I'm honored. I love drag. Right by the term drag queen as well. You and, I had, you and I have had this discussion when we when we actually did the concert called Queens and we were honoring drag queens and we had this whole discussion about whether or not the sisters fell into that category or not. And you were like, wow, that's good. Let's do it. Um, okay, so you moved from Michigan to San Francisco. What brought you? So I actually had a friend in college who was a year ahead of me. He graduated and moved to San Francisco. So my junior year, I came out to visit him in the summer of 1984. And I didn't, I'd never been to California before. I really didn't know what to expect. And as you can imagine, being a junior in college from a conservative town and coming to San Francisco and it being June, and stumbling upon your first pride, I had no idea that it was even, that there was such a thing as a pride celebration. And I found myself surrounded by a million other people just like me. And I knew then and there that I had to live here. I mean, just the idea that a parade could start at the Civic Center and and march through the financial district to the steps of City Hall was just overwhelming to me. I just, I knew that I'd found my home. So I graduated from college and I waited uh, just through the summer because summers in Michigan are fabulous. 
And I moved, <laughs> I moved out here the fall of 85. And wow. so uh, within a month, I had my own apartment in the Haight. I had a job. And then two years after that, I met Sister Luscious Lashes. Right. And so uh, in the story that I've, that I've read, there were just a, a gaggle. There were just a few um, sisters at that time, really. And your impression was? Well, I was with my friend Matthew and a few other of us after work in our power ties, having two for one cocktails at the Midnight Sun, actually. And you know how when you're at the Midnight Sun, the videos are playing and everybody sort of is looking up at the screens and casually cruising and sipping their cocktails. And the door blew open and in walked this crazy showgirl clown nun. And I swear for the first time that day, everyone in the bar just kind of stopped talking and stopped what they were doing. And she had everyone's attention. And she was smiling and laughing and she seemed to know everybody by name. She greeted the bartender, he gave her a drink. And my friends and I were like, what is that? Who is that? What is happening? And she walked right up to me and she said to me, hello, Michael, which is my birth name. Right. And I was like, what, do I know you? And she goes, it's me, Norman. I go, what are you doing? <laughs> goes, I'm Sister Luscious Lashes with the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And I had never heard of the order before. I didn't, I didn't know, but I thought she looked fabulous. So we hung out and we had a good time. And before you know it, she had me hooked into the group. I started volunteering just in my secular persona as a boy, uh, working events with them and everything. And the more I got to know about the order, the more I learned about the activism and the important role that the sisters played in the early fight against HIV and AIDS. And I was just impressed by their bravery, really, and their chutzpah. And, and they showed me a world that I didn't know existed. And they opened a part of me that I didn't know existed. And it was like my head exploded. And I was like, oh my gosh, I care about people in my community. And I see wrongs that need to be corrected and things I need to stand up and fight for. And literally in less than a year, I'd become a fully professed member and joined the sisters. That's Tell me, uh, I mean, it's, it's just spectacular. And I have so many questions that I, kn I know that our audience has as well. Tell me the first time you painted your face. I had never done drag before in my life. So, and I never even considered it. I hadn't thought about it. And Sister Luscious Lashes and some friends of mine called ourselves the cheerleaders from hell. And we would go cheer for the Eagle softball team during the, the Gay Softball League. And one day, Lush just said to me, why don't you just try the face? Try and do a face. I'll put you in non-drag, which, by the way, was completely against the rules. And <laughs> I, I just... <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. She showed me how to apply the white face. And then she said, just paint whatever comes naturally. And I'm a, a very a graphic, I'm a graphic designer, I'm a graphic artist, I have been for years and years. So I painted this really, really sharp edge sort of war paint look that was super graphic. And it was rough and, and very edgy and I loved it. Like we went to brunch at the Patio Cafe on Castro Street, of course. In face. In face, my first time in public, I was wearing, I have a picture of it on my refrigerator. I was illegal, not illegal, none. <laughs> yes. And I remember sitting there with her at brunch and I picked up the knife at the table and I just kept looking at myself in the mirror. I just thought I was so amazing. <laughs> and that's really the kind of confidence and self absorption that you have to have to pull off drag. I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well think you're the most fabulous thing alive. Yeah. And so <laughs> that was sort of my attitude at the time. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I, I, I just have this visual. Did you put on the habit? You painted your face, but did you have a habit that day? Yeah. She, she let me an extra habit and a wimple and everything. So I. You know, good thing that that was the beginning of the, of the sisters, because I think now that it's so organized that I don't think you've gotten away with that. Right. Well, as you had touched upon, the order at one time was about 40 strong. Sister Chanel 2001 was Gilbert Baker, who designed the rainbow flag, and Sister Vicious Power Hungry Bitch, who is still the sister today, uh, had had a falling out. And then sisters, of course, died, moved on. Things happened, HIV, AIDS. Um, and so there was really about five active sisters at this time. So 
rules had relaxed a little bit and, and right. Lush was always one for bending the rules. Oh my gosh. All right. So um, now I'm going to take you back uh, to the, to the larger picture of the, uh, what, what it, the sisters of perpetual indulgence, what does it mean for, for the order to be so in your face as a nun? I mean, taking this sacred iconic person in our society and just turning on its head. What significance does that have? Right. Well, I, I believe that the founders sort of just did it as a way of guerrilla theater. It all started in 1979 on Easter weekend. And they had these old nuns habits that they borrowed from a convent in Iowa. And they decided to throw them on and see what would happen. So they went to the Castro and they went through the mission. They went out to the gay beach and everywhere they went, Sister Vish likes to say that they were met with psychological car crashes everywhere that they went. <laughs> because nobody had really ever seen men dressed as nuns before. So they got together and, and a couple other people joined them and they realized that they were kind of onto something. So they came together, came up with a name, the Sisters Perpetual Indulgence, and they formed an organization. That was uh, 79 and then just a year or two later, HIV and AIDS started to ravage the community. And that's when the sisters really found their purpose. To to answer your question, actually today though, uh, the nun habit I've always realized is very, can be very polarizing and it's been a double-edged sword to me in a lot of ways. I grew up Catholic. I went to a private Catholic college and um, I know that a lot of people just can't get past the idea of it and the look when they see it. But the hope is that when you get to know us and you see the work that we do, you understand that we're not making fun of nuns. We are nuns. And this is a, this is a great way to get the attention that you need to get your message heard and to do the work that we do. That is perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that, because it makes all the sense in the world. Of course, there is that initial shock factor, the, the car crash, which I think is hilarious. Um, but that initial shock factor obviously shakes people up. And then they have to really look past that, as you said, to, to, to imagine why you would do this and what, what is the reason that now it's worldwide, this phenomenon. It is. We're like Starbucks, girl. We are everywhere. It's so crazy. We have sisters on four continents. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's just amazing. How did the persona de- develop? You know, I, I, I just always sort of been myself and I really try to approach people with a familiar attitude. I treat everybody the same. I don't care if you're a Hollywood movie star or sit on the executive board or if you're someone that happens to be living in a tent on the street, I will greet you and acknowledge you and strike up a conversation. I have friends who are like, you know, what they, they, they think if I was alone on the corner with a stop sign, I'd start talking to the stop sign, right. <laughs> which may be true. But um, <clears throat> so I think that my natural personality sort of shone through the makeup. And I also realized that I had a platform. So right away after I joined the sisters and was fully professed by the order, Um, I took off running with it. Like I started to write a column for Odyssey magazine. I started to host uh, nightclubs with Gus Bean, Colossus. I was actually a host at the opening night of Colossus. I um, I got on the main stage at San Francisco Pride. I started to host Folsom Street Fair. I just was out there. And one of the things that I did in my very beginning of my sisterhood was I created the Stop the Violence campaign, which was a response to a rise in hate crimes in San Francisco in 1989. And that's a program that we continue today. So I I was also, I was a party nun. I was out there all about, you know, it girl or whatever, but I was also really doing the work because I was committed to honoring the sisters who came before me and carrying on the important work that the order does. The most photographed nun in the world, in, in the history of the world. Um, where are all the photographs? That name is hilarious to me because there's really a story behind it. I know it sounds rather conceited to proclaim myself the most photographed nun in the world. But the story behind it is is an honest one. And it's because uh, one year after the Folsom Street Fair, which I hosted for 15 years with Heglina, you know, um, yeah. it was extremely hot. It was a really, really hot year. And we were done emceeing and I was just trying to get out of the fair. And everybody was stopping me wanting photos and 
it, which is always very flattering. But at the same time, I was in a mood. I was just hot. My feet hurt. I was over it. So I pushed my way through the crowd and made it to my friend's J house. And I just fell in a chair at his apartment. I was like, ugh. If one more person asks me for a photograph, I am just going to scream. I'm so over it. And he looked at me and he said, well, you better enjoy it because one day no one will. Oh. And oh. it just hit me with a, like a pain <laughs> hit me. And I was like, oh my God, he's so right. I am such an ungrateful right now. <laughs> it was so, I was embarrassed and I was ashamed of myself. And I, from that day forward, I swear to God, I said, I will never deny anyone a photo. I, th that is just delicious. Tell me about, uh, because the sisters are, are multicolored, people of color, uh, all kinds. How, how have you all been during this time of Black Lives Matter and the, and the protests and all of that? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked because the sisters originally were a group of, of gay white men. And it took some time for women and trans people to be attracted to the group and also people of color because they may not have been sure that they were welcome there. But the fact is that the sisters are, as you might imagine, not only colorful and extremely left-leaning, we are welcoming to everyone. So we have encouraged members from every possible walk of life, gay, straight, male, female, everywhere in between and all races. So I'm pleased, really, really, really pleased and happy to say that we have more sisters of color now than ever. And as you know, Sister Ash, uh, Belladonna Summer. Yes. Belladonna Summer is a uh, out and proud black sister and yes. also a member of your chorus. Yes. So uh, we love Bella Donna. She's absolutely fantastic. We've been working with her to actually start an initiative on the Sisters Facebook page. Uh, we decided to dedicate Pride to Black Pride Month. So we're recognizing outstanding leaders in the Black community living and dead every day with a new post. And that's, that's been really exciting and fun to see. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, um, you have beautiful jewelry. I also have beautiful jewelry adorning here, and I'm going to let you tell the studio audience, or not in the studio, the, the virtual world, what is this, Sister Roma? That beautiful pin that has been catching my eye as it glimmers in the light of your camera is your saint pin, because you... Tim Selig are a saint with the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And if someone's watching who doesn't know, the Sisters' highest honor that we bestow on people for their outstanding community service and work that they do that emulates the values of the Sisters is to present them with sainthood. And we bamboozled you <laughs> and did a, a rogue sainting at the lovely Christmas concert. Well, how many years ago was that concert? Oh, I, I don't know. Four? About yeah, four or five, I would say. Yeah. yeah. And uh, because everybody knows, you know, you are the conductor and in charge. So we, I was worried that this, that you would be upset. I was like, do you think he's going to be mad? And I don't like surprises. <laughs> you don't like surprises. And everybody on your team was clear about that. Yeah. But we were like, oh, we have to do it. So we did it at the last show. So there wouldn't be as much pressure. And uh, you weren't mad. No, I was so honored. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I just... I think it's funny because, you know, people throughout my past would not nominate me for sainthood on any level. And the fact that you all did it means the world to me, obviously. I, I cherish this so much. I, I, I just say one thing. I, I, I love what you do as the director of the Gay Men's Chorus. Such an amazing organization. Just the entertainment and the message that you deliver is so beautiful. But my entire perspective of the chorus changed when our friend Larry Nelson brought me to Brian Young's holiday Christmas party. You know, Brian does that huge potluck in his gorgeous condo is decorated and the chorus comes there. And I was, a, I was like a newbie to the chorus. I was like, hi, you know, they're all, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't know. And uh, I was just hooked on that party and that's where I met Ryan. And Ryan and I sat on the couch and just cackled and kikied and hoo hooed all night long. We became really, really good friends. And then when Ryan died in concert, 
when the game was course on stage, uh, everybody was devastated, devastated. But I went to his memorial in Golden Gate Park with the chorus. And that's when I saw what a family it is. And the community that you have built and that you nurture is so important and so beautiful to see. I am honored to be included in anything and everything that you do because it opened my eyes to what an amazing organization it is behind the curtain, if you will. Thank you. It is. It is. I I didn't build it, but thank you. I I have nurtured it. Okay. I've watched the the film, the short film, of you putting on your makeup. (laughs) And you... Does it always take you three hours? It does. And it, I, as many years as I've been doing this, if you can imagine, it just, it's a real process. I mean, you know what I look like. Yeah. Oh, it ain't this. This ain't it. <laughs> well, okay. So I, I wanted to bring that in because when we asked um, Sister Roma to be on Behind the Curtain, this is not a small investment because we're in the middle of COVID. We're sheltering in place. We're not going out. And you did that just for us. It's not like you've got three benefits to go to, which actually in the real world, when you, when you do, when you manifest, you probably have eight or 10 appearances that you can do, but this one's just for us. And it's so special. Thank you for spending that three hours. And I was going to ask if there is some kind of uh, meditative process, because if you're doing that, you're going, this is a lot of, of three hours. Just looking at yourself is a lot of self-reflection, so to speak. <laughs> as we um, as we wrap this up, I want to thank you from uh, the bottom of my heart. Um, as someone who uh, does this kind of thing, uh, it doesn't take me three hours to get ready. I don't have to face um, the ridicule, the shock, the um, the uh, unconscious or conscience or conscious rejection, you you set yourself up for that every day, but it's all for a reason. And your courage through these years and doing this, uh, it's, as you said, it's not a game, you're not a clown, it has a reason. And for all of us who have been touched by what you do, people who've been changed by the things that you personally have done and the sisters, We could never thank you enough. It is a gift. You are a gift to the world. And I'm so honored to be your friend and to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Your words are too kind. I do want to point out that I only touch consensually. (laughs) For the record. Right. And now we'll touch consensually with a mask. It's not the same, but nonetheless, much love to you. Thank you. Thank you for this time. And and stay well. Thank you. You too. Love you. Mwah.